Uh, so it was $1.1 million ERA and $3.3 million TCV. We started the relationship. This was an existing account with a very small spend and we had to reset the relationship. So the economic buyer was previously the CMO, which had left. Um, all our previous champions had left. And we were then having a direct line with just one stakeholder at the time, which was uh, the guy who was managing the platform technically. Um, he was a great coach, but he had no power or influence. He thought he was a champion. He thought he could help expand it out. But a few times when we tested him, he was unable to get us in the right places, put us in the right meetings, and very early realized that, hey, this guy, although he's got the right intentions, doesn't have the power to or influence to help progress. And we had to go back to the basics. Hey there, my name is Pim. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer here at Medic, and this is another episode of Elite Dealers. With that, I'm welcoming to the stage Misha. Welcome, man. Brilliant. Thanks, Pim. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, Misha, we're going to talk about one of your key deals, right, that you did in, in the, um, one of uh, the, the recent uh, uh, years. I think we want to start with uh, setting the scene a little bit. Can you talk us through, like, type of customer, type of solution, length of sales cycle, those kind of things here? Sure. This was around a nine-month sales cycle deal, uh, one in which was with a large public UK tech company. At the time, it was the largest deal in Amir at Salesloft and the second largest deal globally. What are we talking about numbers-wise? Uh, so it was $1.1 million ERA and $3.3 million TCV. So it was a three-year deal and it was in the context of an organization where the average deal size was around 50K ARR. So it was rare to do a deal like this, but one in which I'd say was probably both the toughest, but also the most enjoyable deal of my career to date. Um, and it, it involved over 60 stakeholders on the customer side, 30 stakeholders on our side, many times where I thought the deal wouldn't happen. And ultimately it became a, a life-changing deal for me. I was already significantly over target for the year and in top uh, accelerator bands and this deal came in the day before the end of the financial year i mean that that's crazy talk about a needle mover deal there right on multiple accounts uh, i suppose and uh um i think uh what, what's it by the way i i think i saw on your linkedin profile that you had a quarter where you had like between eight and nine hundred percent is it that quarter that this deal fell into yeah that was the quarter I think one thing to get into a little bit here is that typically what we, what I would suspect is that there's a strong foundation in terms of the organization being set up to, to do deals like that, right? Or at least to get into evaluations like that. Typically we see a kind of like a playbook for, for a team like this. What, what was that like for you at the time? I'd say that we were, we were just starting to adopt playbook type approaches. So one of my best friends growing up, uh, was on his um, way up at a company called Multiverse, working for Jeremy Duggar and Steve McClaskey. And he, he was very much learning and applying at the Medic Playbook. And I was learning it from him at the time and applying it at Salesloft and actually got the organization to roll Medic out globally in partnership with my VP of sales, Wally Sharp at the time. And I was really advocating to bring on board a frontline leader that really knew Medic. And just so happened, we managed to make a hire of a guy called Will Eves, who used to work at Sprinkler. And he came in at a, a very critical time when this deal was just starting to take off and helped me apply the Medic playbook. And also we hired uh, one of Sprinkler's lead value, um, business value consultants at the time as well. And so those two resources and those two people coming in um, to kind of help me take what was in theory, uh, something that we could then execute in practice on this deal. A lot of playbook history uh, together there in the, in one answer, Misha. I think that a uh, a fun fact for our audience is that Sprinkler is also the place where our founder here at Medic, Andy White, and Dick Dunkel, the creator of the Medic framework, first met and worked together. Now they are both here at Medic, uh, this company, right? Um, and then we had someone uh, recently join the team in the in Jake, who came from Multiverse as well. And and what you typically see with people who come from like a, a playbook background is that they have a very clear set of um, requirements per uh, stage of the sales cycle, right? And a very 
methodological uh, a way of, of working through the motions so that medic underpins those motions, right? Was that the same for you in this particular deal? Yeah, d definitely. So, I mean, very early on, the, f the focus was trying to get early executive engagement and find pain uh, and champion and validate validating pain with um, an executive that would then sponsor an evaluation. And we, we started the relationship. This was an existing account with a very small spend and we had to reset the relationship. So the economic buyer was previously the CMO, which had left. Um, all our previous champions had left and we were then having a direct line with just one stakeholder at the time, which was, uh, the guy who was managing the platform technically, um, he was a great coach, but he had no power or influence. He, he thought he was a champion. He thought he could help expand it out. But a few times when we tested him, he was unable to get us in the right places, put us in the right meetings and very early realized that, Hey, this guy, although he's got the right intentions, doesn't have the power to or influence to help progress. And we had to go back to the basics and PG, pipeline generate. I get to the right stakeholder that could help um, make this deal start to move and start to build it. Yeah, and Misha, I recently saw um, another podcast where you came on and you talked about the concept of creating a, a POV, a point of view, right? Is that something that you would do that early on in your process? and and. Can you talk us through what that looks like? Yeah, definitely. So I'd say right at the beginning, especially when you're trying to get early executive engagement, you know, you need to come with some sort of point of view. You need to come with some sort of opinion. Otherwise, you know, there's no reason for that executive to engage with you. Um, they're not, they don't have time to sit and do discovery with you and tell you what's important. And so early on, I kind of took it upon myself to figure out well, what are the most important initiatives and drivers in the organization that we can try and attach uh our, our solution to and so we both did desk research um on the annual report to find out the key drivers uh one in which uh they were they had a leaky bucket renewal was a big problem for them and also they were trying to take out huge amounts of costs from the base and part of that our hypothesis could be moving to a lower cost uh model of sales moving to inside sales which didn't really exist in a big way in the organization and then what also supplemented the POV is is information about how the existing deployment was going. So I was able to engage uh, the VP of sales for the group of reps. It was about 100 reps that already had um, sales left at the time and able to gather metrics on how that was performing and gather something that could help open up a conversation around uh, the fact that it's already proven that our solution could help them generate more pipeline, could help them work in a lower cost of sale inside sales model. And so it was a combination of figuring out where they're going and figuring out kind of indications that we've already proven that we could support that direction as well. And it was really critical to getting that early meeting with the chief revenue officer. So what had this deal really started with uh, building a POV and then arming our chief revenue officer with a very specific tailored message to set a meeting with their chief revenue officer. And so it was an exec to exec uh, outreach. And that meeting is where we validated our assumptions. We got feedback on our assumptions. Some things were off, some things were correct, and we refined it. And we were able to get introductions to multiple different VPs of different lines of businesses that were able to then, we were able, able to then work with to start to build out this deal with an agreement that we would then report back to the CRO and report back what we found. So really he, he sponsored our evaluation from the beginning uh, because we were able to come with point of view that really did touch upon uh key initiatives that he was focusing on and in charge of <clears throat> yeah no i love that so you're attaching yourself to those strategic initiatives right and the pov empowers you to to naturally transition the the amount of access that you have within the business right to earn the right i think um you you call it uh, somewhere else as well if if you think about uh, pain, which is something you mentioned a second ago, what we typically say like, yeah, I mean, all uh, metric elements, for example, right, have their have their importance, have their role. Without pain, there's not really anything to do, right? There's nothing that um, uh, to solve for. And so you brought up uh, pain in combination with a vast amount of stakeholders, and the same pain can look different for uh, different stakeholders, right? So as you were building up 
uh, the report with these VPs and expanding your view into the business. How were you going about articulating pain to those respective new stakeholders that came into, say, the arena of your deal here? Yeah, good, good question. So, so the way the way that we approach the engagement is that we were we focused it all around you know value pyramid of what the company was trying to do, and then there were value drivers within within that value pyramid that then associated to these different VPs. So, they all had their own challenges that associate that related to the overall transformational deal that we ended up doing which we branded as a go-to-market transformation um but we ended up engaging with the vp of customer success the vp of renewals the vp of inside sales uh regional vps of, of sales and uh that initial scene setting whenever we met a new stakeholder on the bigger picture um before that we then delve into their element I think helped us keep control of the deal because we, we were managing it very transparent to say, hey, we're talking to all of these different people and we're building a unified proposition. And they could then trust that then we would then further their agenda, of getting what they wanted as part of that bigger project without them having to be the individual that drived it. Because we were very conscious that if any single VP became our deal champion, then we end up with a single uh, deal that's divisional level. And yet what we were trying to do is tie these all up into one complete deal that then we could take to the board as something that addressed a bigger strategic initiative rather than just a VP level initiative. So I think it was both around giving that wider context of what you're working on and then being able to then go into the detail with that technical champion or that use case champion. Can you talk to us about the role that decision criteria played in this? Because when you have when you have the the pain and you start to quantify the impact of the solution by way of positioning the metrics and getting consensus on that then the how you uniquely do that is is going to be articulated and and uh something that you reach a consensus on by way of decision criteria right so so how did that work in this specific deal decision criteria was fairly critical uh, to this deal so early on we were thinking about seeding our requirements that were specific to us only that we could do even though the deal wasn't competitive at the time and there was uh a situation very late stage where a competitor entered the mix which we kind of predicted at some stage if the deal becomes real that they might start to look elsewhere and if we hadn't protected ourselves by getting consensus on uh mutually agreed uh written down decision criteria then we could have been in a really tough spot because we were competing against a free product and service uh when we got to that stage in the deal so it was hey do you want to spend 3.3 million dollars with us or do you want to spend some spend nothing on a solution that's in the same category that theoretically could do the same thing if you don't dig be- look between the head beneath the head yeah no i love that man because the thing is once you start articulating your value and and arm it with decision criteria you start um well sort of uh, protecting yourself um against competitors coming in and saying like oh yeah i can do this too and we're probably going to be cheap yeah, the whole Me Too thing. We had it exactly that. Me Too, we can do that too. You already work with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, maybe a transition to, to competition there. In this particular deal, was it just rivals or was like inertia or other initiatives that would be uh, linked to the the sort of the um, strategic business in- initiatives in that value pyramid uh, competition as well? Yeah, it was... Uh, it was a- all, all of those so we, we had a do nothing like we have too much other stuff on our plate like we they were rolling out doing a big it implementation at the time that was taking everyone's attention um it was a competitor um that said hey we could do the same thing as well and also we had uh personnel changes mid deal cycle so we got to a stage where we could have potentially done the renewals only deal um but then that didn't happen and then a quarter later we could have done the inside sales only deal but that didn't happen because uh people were moving role mid deal and we had to win over new champions that so a person took over sale uh, a person took over renewals and customer success globally and we then needed to meet that person and bring them on board and make them a champion and then we had uh, a situation where the cro wanted to make sure that the budget came from the global IT transformation budget and that wasn't going to happen if it wasn't a global transformation initiative across all divisions. If it was a divisional level thing, it would have had to come out of his budget. And so it it became the situation where 
we couldn't transact any of the smaller pieces without transacting the whole. Okay, that's interesting. So you also started um, tying in uh, economical decision criteria there, right? That's that's uh, and and by the way, what I did like, um, and this is going uh, back a small step there. When you talked about decision criteria from the beginning, this was something very proactive, right? So you were positioning everything like the, the POV and all the meetings that you had early on building the, the early uh, champions, et cetera, with a mindset of like, hey, it's not something that I need to uncover from the customer. We need to build them together and reach a consensus on it so that later on when we need it, it's going to be our protection against competition. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, definitely. That's fair to say. And when you speak about playbook, so very early on, we were approaching it with the mindset of identifying use cases, then documenting required um, what requirements related to those use cases, and then calculating the impact that each of those use cases would have. And so where we ended up with is a business case that could stand on its own for each division, but then rolled up into one unified business case. And beneath, beneath that were requirements, were decision criteria that we had seeded from the very beginning of the deal. And some had developed, but ultimately that's what protected us from not losing the deal at the end when we had this Me Too competitor come in and offer the same thing for free, which it wasn't actually the same thing, but could have been seen as the same thing if we hadn't gone through that process. Hey, so Amisha, the context of this deal is that it's vastly bigger than anything else that the company, especially on a EMEA perspective, had seen before, right? So. What can you what can you share around like the, the the process elements here, like the decision process and the paper process, and, and well, which was probably different than the typical deals that you guys would see. Yeah, so I'd say that what's unique about a deal like this is that you have to bring the whole company around a shared vision of the deal, and you are just as much selling internally as you are selling externally, and you're also project managing internally, bringing the subject matter experts for each piece and motivating them around it and ensuring that they own a piece of it that they can run with. And I'd say the the very end of the final two, three weeks when we were in procurement negotiation, um, there were there some very tough moments of intense negotiations with the US, intense negotiations with my CFO, my CRO, my CEO. And I think having built a strong reputation in the organization prior to this deal happening, unlocked a lot of things that were possible at that stage that maybe otherwise wouldn't have possible, uh, would have been, wouldn't have been possible. Um, and so I would say just not to underestimate that element of you're not just selling to the customer, you're selling to uh, your internal stakeholders as well, and even trying to motivate them to work on your deal uh, and feel good about working on your deal. Yeah, you're selling on both sides of the engagement, right? That's fallen. And something that I want to pick up um, on or what you said there had to do with... Uh, with ownership. I think that what we see a lot in our industry is that deal ownership is typically seen as something that the AE has, right? Or they're the owner of the deal. But to your point, it really takes, well, basically a large part of your organization and the customer's organization to make something like this come to life, right? To make it happen. And therefore, when we think about ownership, it's really like the the sort of the, the team game there, right? It's, it's our deal to win and also ours to lose and not necessarily the that that the um well the ownership of that deal is on one single person in the team did you did you feel that that was the case in the environment that you were operating in at the time yeah definitely i think the deal you know never would have been done without all of the people that rallied behind it on our side i think i said before there was around 30 people involved on our side some more involved than others but part of that was um stake individual stakeholders on our side owning uh stakeholders on their side and so owning uh, champion building of certain certain individuals or then trying to take that relationship to the next level. So having our VP of services map to um, individuals that were designing the rollout plan, uh, having our CRO mapped to their CRO and then making sure that I was managing them almost like chess pieces, but also making them feel like they've got autonomy and giving giving them freedom, obviously, to do their own thing. But strategically making sure that the right people are having conversations with the right people and then they then own the element of champion building within the deal. Yeah, I mean, multi-threading is definitely on both sides of the engagement as well, right? It's not just you um, connecting with multiple people on the customer side. And so when you think about champion building specifically there, 
Is there anything that you guys did from a champion building perspective uh, by way of like having certain events like champion building events? Okay, so this was at a time where we were just coming out of COVID. So it was actually frustrating that a lot of it happened remotely, uh, but we did push as hard as possible to try and get some in-person engagements. And I think one challenge we ran into kind of mid-deal cycle is that we had uh, multiple different champions for different segments of the deal. So we had a champion in the VP of renewals and customer success. We had a champion in uh, inside sales. We had a champion in regional field sales uh, leaders. But we didn't necessarily have one uh, deal champion that could pull it all together. And the CRO kind of could play this role, but he was too busy day to day to actually be an effective deal champion. And we ended up uh, basically uh, identifying that one of our uh, sales operations champions had, uh, he was a technical champion at the time. He, he then get, got promoted into a VP of go to market transformation role. And this is where we started to kind of shape the whole message against that initiative. Uh, go to market transformation with sales loft is how we branded it and built, built the message. And we honed in and targeted on, on, on realizing that this guy could be the perfect deal champion to get this done. And, uh, this is his initiative that he could drive. And this guy lived in Barcelona. So we we're trying to figure out how we could uh, engage this guy. And just so it happened, we had a co company offsite in Barcelona. And so we messaged and said, hey, we're going to be in town. And me and my manager, we stepped away from the offsite. We m missed most of the offsite for, for this dinner that we had. And basically had a very long dinner. I think it lasted about three hours um, where... We just well, that's long for you. I'm not sure if in, in Spain they consider that a very long dinner. Okay, maybe a very short dinner in, in Spain. Yeah. We had like a nine nine course meal, um, which was great fun and uh, really kind of built a very good relationship with this guy. And um, he he was very instrumental in getting the deal done. We built a personal relationship. We didn't just talk about business. Um, not much of that conversation was about the deal or about business. Um, but having that in-person engagement enabled to build that stronger level of trust and stronger relationship to be able to I mean, add a, a high la layer of transparency and trust in the engagement so that later on when things got a little bit tough, we could rely on each other to get things done. So w would you say that this person was your main champion going forward? I'd say this person was our deal champion going forward after that, uh, after that event. So we had all of these use case champions across the business and they were all very much critical in getting it done but this person was the most instrumental in packaging it all up into one transformational uh project if you think about the the learnings because this is a deal that will stay with you forever right this this is a story that will always uh be remembered but also i think that there's a lot of learnings on your part that you take into um well you, your current next step already and then whatever you do uh, in the in the future if you would have to sum up like the three biggest learnings from this from this deal, like what would they be? Yeah, I'd say specifically from this deal, um, it definitely hit home around the fact that pain and champion is really the most important are the most important ingredients for any deal uh, of any size. You know, some something worth changing, someone who cares about changing it and has power and influence, and really this deal was built upon. A big enough pain and multiple different significant pains that were VP level that then added up to board level pain and a set of people that were motivated to make it change based upon their own personal motivations and they had the power and influence uh, to start to help progress change in the organization. So I'd say, you know, without pain and champion, you've got nothing. And I think that stands true uh, in any sales situation is a very kind of, uh, I guess, easy way to simplify it in many situations. And the second thing I'd say is when it comes to doing like a transformation deal or a mega deal, as some people call it, I'd say that um, the most important thing to make it warranted to be a big enough, a big deal is to make sure that you're aligning to the most important board initiatives. Imagine every board has got, you know, a set of things that are the most important things to focus upon. And if you're attached or you're a part of solving those initiatives, that's what warrants prioritization. That's what warrants uh, executive level engagement. That's what warrants big deals. Everything else is just going to be noise to the board. They're not going to want to engage with it because it's going to be too much distraction. And I think what I learned here is what was so uh, what worked so well about it is we were able to take 
our tech solution. And we were able to make it a key enabler to deliver upon a board level initiative. Um, and I think without that, yeah, we would have ended up with multiple smaller deals over a much longer period of time, um, coming from not a overall budget, but, you know, individual budgets. And then the final thing I'd say, just, I said to myself, to just be patient and trust in the process. Ups and downs are inevitable in sales and all scenarios, but especially in cycles like this. And I still struggle this with this myself sometimes. And I definitely struggle with it on this deal. There were many times where we lost the deal before we won it. And my chief revenue officer, Steve Goldberg at Sales Loft, who, who's a tremendous salesperson, tremendous guy, uh, always, used, always used to say, uh, we'll lose a deal many times before we win a deal. And that that is regularly the case, and especially the case in deals like this. I love that. I believe there's even some stats on that, that, that you get like 40 times a no before it's a yes, right? And I think that applies in a general sense to something like this. Um, before my final question, I'm just, just wrapping up here with some of my highlights, so the way that you go about decision criteria proactively here, right? Because I, I agree with where you're saying like, hey, pain and champion to make sure that there's something important enough to solve for and someone who uh, who owns it, right? With the right level of power and influence, it's going to be your partner in the evaluation. But then like the decision criteria is where you're going to make the difference and in the long run, protect yourself against uh, anything else that 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 customer might be looking at, right? I think uh, we, we spent a lot of time on, on the, the playbook and uh, creating that POV, which is like an absolute a lead thing to do to make sure that you get access to the right stakeholders, right? And the way that you uh, went about building multiple champions, not just you, but multi-threading on both sides of the engagement is one of the takeaway as well. All while attaching yourselves to uh, strategic initiatives, because that's where you uncover like, um, well, how big the pain really is, attach it to the value that you can uh, unlock and together like that value and pain will drive the urgency here right so um yeah absolutely loved it man so final question here for you misha the biggest piece of advice you would give a 10 years younger misha right now what would it be i would say to myself that being in sales is a long game and to be patient trust that if you build the right skills build a good reputation and you build strong relationships that it will pay off at some stage and probably multiple stages so don't be too worried about any given year as long as you're focusing on those things i'd say that patience is probably the biggest thing i still struggle with now and uh when you look back retroactively you start to realize that things do go your way if you keep doing the right things yeah no i i definitely resonate with that man so i think that is spot on thank you for sharing that and thank you for being on uh, on the show today. You are an absolute legend. Uh, thanks for making the time. And um, yeah, all the best and hopefully uh, till next time. Thanks, Thank Misha. you. Appreciate it, Pim. Thanks for having me on.